working with the Western Region Drug and Alcohol Task Force since 2009 I came into post. I'm one of the funded workers with the WRDATF. My actual employer is the GRETB and I'd like just to acknowledge them here today because they've been very much part of the program here and one of the co-funders as well. Um, and I think it was 2017 we first saw a bit of news internationally the, I think a lot of people here might have seen it. You know what's going on in Iceland. You know Iceland knows how to ha stop teenage substance use. What's you know so so we were trying to get in touch with them for a number of months actually, sending up emails and not getting much back. But I think the first time I went, I went to meet uh, the, there's the current kind of chair or the ch CE of the organisation Planet Youth at the time. Um, the guy called Jan Sigvison. I went to meet him in Belfast Castle because he was coming to give a presentation there to the health trusts. Um, so I went up to meet him there. I think I was, I was the only one from the Republic. It was all, you know, some kind of senior people in health agencies and Department of Education and stuff up, up in Northern Ireland um, who were interested in what they had to say but haven't really been able to move anything on up there based on the fact that they don't have a government in place, right? So uh, the real purpose of going up to meet him was to see could he come to Galway, right, to talk to us about what this was, to give the same presentation he gave in Belfast, come to Galway and do it. And he was him and Han, him and Han, kind of busy, I'm not, sh not so sure. So it, 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 I sort of thought I had him convinced, but off he went to Iceland and then that was it. I was kind of gone quiet again. So another email came in, would you come up to a webinar, sorry, rather a, a two-day seminar. And Peter, you were there. Peter Barrett's here from Public Health in Cork. Um, I think we were the only two from Ireland. So we took the trouble to go to that. Um, Interesting, for sure. We came away, and really, what I was trying to do was say, Listen, "Can I? I'm going to have to go up here to convince him to come to Galway." And really, it was to pin him down, get it in his diary, and he came here to to meet us. Actually, in this room, I think in 2018, in February 2018. And the thinking at the time, initially, was that we would try and get a Planet Youth implementation up and off the ground and running in Galway City, just the city, because we had 10 schools, a tight enough geographical space. Um, lots of services and lots of opportunity but when we we had our regional sort of people here the heads of agency various people come to have a look and we sort of polled everybody afterwards say what do you think and pretty much everybody in the room said you know that this could be really worth a go so we then set about how do we start to get this thing up and running and part of that was trying to uh, get co-funders on board so we have what's called a service level agreement with the people in iceland and that would cover this just gets us to go really it's sort of the idea would pay for the survey process you know the, the licensing the questionnaire survey processing you know returning the data set guidance program it's, it's, it sort of pays for all that and it's amounted to roughly 10,000 per annum for our three sites which are going Mayros common so we spend about 150,000 odd across the three sites over the five years that just gets us to go everything else that's been paid for has been a combination of really helpful co-funding from the likes of Tusla We've been very supportive in, you know, finding money to, to underpin my post, really, so I could concentrate a bit more on this. Um, so they give us a little bit of funding for that, or quite a bit of funding for that. And everything else has been paid for by, the, essentially, grants here and there, dormant account money, lottery money, whatever the grant comes over the horizon, maybe we'll put in for Planet Youth, Tusla, the Parent Participation Fund, uh, SIPSI money, um, Healthy Ireland money, not in this round, but in previous round. And everything else really has been operational budget of the task force. So I'd like to acknowledge Michal Durkin, who's sitting here at the front, for being incredibly supportive and working extremely hard on this project with me. Uh, and Caroline Dignan, who's further down the back there, who's been in enormously helpful in the whole project. And, and we have met, I think, weekly about this for several years now. So a lot of work goes on behind the scenes all the time. And I think in total, when we did all the sums, when we were doing the evaluation, I think we spent something around 400,000 euros in everything that's happened here to date. There's probably more than that, if the truth be told, but that's with your stamps and your websites and your materials and your printing and your staff and your bit that goes to Iceland. So that's really sort of investment to date. And, and I'm going to take you through what we've done. It's sort of an A to Z in what we've done in the few years and where maybe a little bit where we're going. So I reckon I've about 35 minutes. I'm going to hit start and we see how we go. Um, kind of a lot to talk about. Almost all I'm going to talk about will be on the .ie. There's materials I've left over here on this sort of a windowsill. What's over here is samples of the school booklets, our county reports, the materials we give to parents and so on. And I didn't want to give to, to everybody coming in the door. One, because we don't have enough to go around. And there's stuff in there that will interest people and stuff over there that, you know, I'll just take that one because that's all I'm interested in. So no point in giving everybody everything because it'll just be a bit of a waste. And all this stuff does get expensive when you start to add it up. 
Lots of stuff is downloadable. The only thing actually probably won't find on here is the individualised reports that we currently do and print and go out to our schools in PDF form and hard copy after every survey. And those, they are expensive to print. It's very expensive to print small numbers, small print runs. It actually gets kind of pricey. It's cheaper to print lots of stuff. And, you know, the cost starts to come down. Um, but we send those reports out to schools to work with. Sort of, they're considered confidential for use of the school. So we wouldn't ever put them out in the public domain. But what I have over here is probably 50 to 60 examples of what a school report looks like. And I take anybody who's here in a school role or interested in what we're doing or interested in the potential of something like this for their area to take one and have a look because they're incredible documents. They're a really clever way that these were worked out. Um, and I would say anybody, you know, really what we're trying to do a little bit of this is, is maybe get the Department of Education to see this a little bit more for what it can be as a project. And that is a really good example of what it can be. Um, so those will be there and maybe go over at the coffee break and grab a few if they're of interest, okay? So moving on, this is why we do it. This wasn't um, on the front page of the Observer and the Atlantic and the whoever else, the Guardian and, and what have you. But this is one of the first slides they'd show if you were ever in Iceland. And I'm sure it's in a lot of presentations you've seen before. I call it their hero, the hero slide, right? So substance use from high to low, 15 years, but have kept them down ever since. Now I need to update this. This is from a, a screenshot from our implementation framework document. So it's a little bit old now. So it's 2019, but I saw one recently up to 2023 and it hasn't changed. It's still down, right? Um, <coughs> what they don't talk about as much, and I think they should, is that lots of other things did happen along the way. So like time spent with parents that has a chart going up the other way. They have physical activity going up the other way. They have educational attainment going up the other way. Early school leaving coming down, uh, crime coming down, bullying coming down. So there's all these other kind of changes that are we want to talk about more here because that's, and I'll show you what, what we're trying to do and promote for the project is that in Dublin and in all over the world really, but certainly in Dublin, Planet Youth is seen as that project over there, that's, that's, that's the Icelandic substance use prevention model that doesn't ever seem to have shown results outside of Iceland, which is true. Right? It's never been evaluated as having been effective anywhere else. To which I would say, I've never seen anybody else put the work into it that we've put into it. Um, usually what happens with Planet Youth is people do surveys and that's not really very much else that happens. Um, Whereas the, the, the premise of this is that you're surveying every two years to get the data to do stuff and do it quickly and so on, right? Um, so it's supposed to be different to your normal survey. Now, normal surveys maybe like the SPAD or HBSC, uh, My World, they're four to five years approximately. Um, they're quite, they're excellent surveys, but you're, they, they tend to be more targeted towards policy and they tend to be quite a while before you see any data or reports. And we, we make quite the effort to get this stuff out fast. I mean, how much do we, we spend a month with our heads down trying to, to work on these and get them out the door. I'm not saying they're perfect every time, but they're fast, do you know? So that's what we try to do. And we've constantly improving. I think over the, over the course of the three surveys, which I'll show you, we've, we've made huge strides in the way the data is presented and in fact what's being presented because we've modified and improved the questionnaire each time that we're using. Um, so this is what you do with the Planet Youth stuff. So you're surveying these kids at 15 and 16 years old on the return to school having sat the junior cert. Why is it done then? Because we want to get the kids using substances. We go much younger than that. They're not starting as much. So we're getting to see what's going on in that space. Um, the one limitation to this is that we're not getting the kids who aren't in school anymore, if that makes sense, right? Um, and obviously those are small numbers of kids, but very high risk kids, usually, right? So it is a limitation, we've given a little bit of thought to how do we improve that and try and incorporate that, and we will um, when we get the time, because there's just so much to be doing all the time with this that it's actually, that's one of the kind of things that's quite hard to, to focus on doing, you know, doing everything. Um, but I know some people have been thinking about that as well. So there, 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 there's, a, there's a way, there's a way, but it's not easy. In fact, it's very hard to even know who's out of school because it, quite a lot of the time it's not, there's no real good mechanism to capture that anywhere. Um, so it's a tricky one. So the survey is extensive, 24 page document, all about their lives at home, their life online, their life in school, their sports, their hobbies, their substance use, their mental health, bullying. We include, start to include sexual health, diet is in there now. 
very detailed, nearly an hour in the original paper-based form. COVID, this is the first survey, September 2018. COVID came over the horizon in March 2020. We didn't know could we even do a survey because we couldn't go into the schools anymore. The kids were in, if you remember, in the classrooms, masks on, windows open. There was a mechanism. So we, we, we did everything online and with DPD, couriers in, couriers out, train the, train the school coordinator to do it. So we're not doing it in-house. They're doing it now. Okay. The most recent, so this survey is unusual in its own right. The data set's unusual. It's the only sig really sizable survey that was done during COVID with this cohort. So it's incredibly interesting survey from that point of view. Roughly, everything's roughly 15 to 20% different during COVID. Mental health, screen use, substance use is down, physical activity is down, you know, so everything was moved, right? Um, and there were questions in there about their COVID experience as well. So it can be, it can be tracked, you know, it, anyway, nobody's really delved into that specific area yet. I think they should, but it's, you know, it's not, it's more of an academic exercise really, but there's an interesting one. Okay, COVID may be the only good thing that came out of it from our point of view. I don't think anything really good came out of COVID, to be honest, but um, it did allow to move the survey online. The schools were able to upgrade their IT. There was grants available. They could maybe they get the broadband in for finally, or they all managed to maybe got 30 iPads or they got tablet banks or laptop banks. Some schools have loads of them, you know, but everybody got to upgrade their IT a bit. So when the third survey came around, the, and this was laborious, this is the undertaking of 5,000 forms coming and going, right? That's a ton of paper that had to be shipped with DHL to Iceland, 2,000 euros to send it, six weeks to guillotine it and scan it. Uh, torturous, right? A, a huge undertaking. And it still is. Even online, it's a huge logistical exercise. Make no mistake of that. It's a lot of work in just that piece alone. But now we're online. Um, we get the data set back that much quicker now. We'll, I think with the next survey, we'll have the data back in all being well, three weeks. We'll have the reports out in seven weeks from when they sit the survey. I think that's probably unheard of. Um, so, well, I maybe put myself under pressure there, and me all too. <laughs> but I think I think it can be I think it can be done, right? Um, and I'll show you why in a minute. So the whole undertaking is trying to find this out. Okay, which is the risk and protective factors in the lives of our young people at this age that we can begin to moderate for the children coming behind. The survey is not about the kids who sit the survey. It's about giving us the intervention, the information to develop community-based interventions to improve the social landscape for the children coming behind so that their numbers, their data is different when they come to sit the survey in two years' time, or four years' time, or ten years' time. I hope I think that makes sense. So very much a focus is on prevention, 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 and the thinking should always be prevention. So it's not, it's not about the kids who set the survey. They're gone. To a degree, their choices are made. They're on their path. Um, they'll be gone in university by the time anything changes or happens, typically. Or they might be even out in the world working, or maybe in a treatment center, who knows. You know, but the, the choice, they're on their path. It's about the, the younger ones, right? Um, now, here in Ireland, as I said, we made a lot of effort to get all of these co-funding agencies. So our, our, the way we did it here, and me and Michal were doing a big road show back in 2018, and it was, we can't afford all of this. So we got co-funding from three agencies in each area. Now, it was a little bit different in Roscommon because we got a big whack of money from uh, a tool administered dormant account, QCBI fund. It was called the What Works Fund now, but it was QCBI at the time. And we thought this was great. We've, all, we've paid for Roscommon for five years, and it was great, but it wasn't that great because with all these agencies putting in a little bit, it brings them to the table. You know, there's a little bit of skin in the game, right, which is important. The missing one here is Roscommon, right? So our plan currently is that we're going to a phase two here, which I'll talk about at the end of the presentation, from 20, really starting now, I think we'll be signing a contract with Planet Youth people in Iceland sometime very soon. So the plan will be 20, starting now to 2028. The data set, the last data set will be with us in early 2029. We're going 23 to 28 with service in 24, 26, 28. And Michal was up in Roscommon last two weeks ago, last Friday, Friday before last, well last Friday, a week ago, talking to the CEO of the relatively new CE Roscommon County Council and they have delighted to say that they've agreed to chip in towards this 
for the for the duration of phase two. So we're pretty much safe now for the for this underpinning funding to run for another five years and three cycles of the survey. Okay, but this is important, this this bit, I would say, right? Okay, so we're taking the voice of the children at this age, and what we're trying to do is improve and bring back in time. We do a big piece of work for the children coming into secondary school. So these are children at 12 and 13 starting on their secondary school journey, first year. Um, but also we do a big piece of work now for children as they're starting into junior infants in the region, national school, called Parent Power, which I'll show you in a second. This is a piece that we try and distribute right across the region. Now there's roughly six and a half, well somewhere between six and seven thousand. Now there's a slight population bulge working its way through at the moment. It's a little bit up and down at the moment, but always somewhere between six and seven thousand children in every school year in our region, whether they're in junior infants or first class or first year or leaving cert. There's roughly in there, right? So what we're doing every year now, and have been since 2019 in fact, is distribute the guidelines for parents booklet to the incoming first year parents and the bedtime fridge magnet sticker, um, which talks about a few different things. It talks a little bit about the project, the importance of keeping family routines and you know having you know good communication at home. We are excellent, by the way, in this space. We have a really, really strong base to build on here in Ireland. And it was, it was pointed out, that we've only had one data presentation from ISON, which is in 2019. We kind of say, well, okay, we got it from here, guys, thank you. But when they did come back that first time, they were saying, actually, the data we're seeing here is the highest of anywhere we've seen in the parenting space. So time with parents, being able to talk to parents, caring more from parents, parental supervision, parental monitoring, all excellent, which is great. Um, and we say that. We, so we usually do 10 minute presentations as any part of first year induction parent night. And a lot of positive reinforcement. There's loads of good stuff in the data, community safety, school experience, school safety. Excellent. I mean, we're, we're really high up in lots of ways here in Ireland. Screen use is chronic. Bedtime is chronic. Sleep is probably the biggest preventable health problem, lack of sleep, that I will show you in a minute. Um, so we talk about this stuff. Um, we talk about this space, extracurricular, the importance of keeping our young people engaged in hobbies and sports that interest them right through their teenage years. They know from years and years of data in Iceland that the kids are doing something three times a week or more. They never appeared in the substance use rates. They never appeared. So that was why they've had this big targeted investment into that space, try and get more people from a young age doing more types of hobbies and sports, um, and really did a very significant investment. Like, I mean, they pumped money into that space. Um, it, it's interesting. I won't go into it too much, but um, here we have the substance use rates. This is the most recent one. Uh, this is the 2022. So we went. 26% drunk in the last month in 2018. This is across the 5,000 kids. 26%. One in four of these 15 to 16 year olds drunk in the last month at the time of the survey. It dropped, I, I'm, I'm winging it here now. If I said 16%, I think, during COVID, something like that. Or was it 20? No, it was 20, I think. So 26 to 20, back up to 30 post COVID. And there has been this little bounce in a couple of ways. And we talk about this, um, and I'm going to show you in a second. I don't think I'm in time. I could wrap it on here for an hour if I'm not careful. Um, this isn't really interesting stuff in here, in the data sets. And I've been talking to Dermot, and I've been talking to Kathleen McDermott, and there's a few people that are going to do a bit more work, I hope, into this from a public health point of view, because there's something badly wrong here in Ireland in parental alcohol supply. Um, and we, I'll show you what the data is kind of sh showing you a little. This is the new bit that was done along the way. This is the National School Junior Infant Parent Power piece. Very much a collaborative effort with Tuslas Parent Sport Champions Project. So I want to acknowledge them here. This goes out to all of the incoming junior infant parents in the region. And we have a shitload. We've got 400 and nearly 460 national schools across Goy Mayor's Common from, you know, a one teacher, two child school in Inish Turk to 600. I think Una, Una Feely's school in Roscommon might be the biggest one in the region, I have a feeling. I think we have a teacher here. Is anybody here from Coleman's Wood? I think they were supposed to be. They might be coming in a while. I think they, they have crazy numbers. I think there are 800 kids up there or something in a national school. It's big, you know. Um, but again, it talks about 
the kind of domains, if you like, or area that we're interested in in the project, right? So again, it talks about getting these sort of idea of good routines early, good routines early. You sit down, you fill in the little booklet with your child. You know, what are we doing well? What could we do better? You know, good routines, family routines and family rituals and family, you know, can you get that stuff going from a young age? Kevin Monaghan have taken this booklet in their project and I think they developed a preschool version of this, or they have. I'm not sure if it's been distributed, but Colette, my, Colette's here somewhere. You could talk to her at the break, maybe. Um, so, and there is an application for that to bring it back further. Do you know? Um, family sleep and bedtimes. Very little guidance in this, by the way. There's nothing in the HSE um, that we could find. So we got some off the NHS, right? But it's, we're, I don't think we're too far off at this age, by the way. We're not a million miles off as parents. I also do a lot of these presentations myself in a room full of parents and say, you know, broadly speaking, we do what our, what our parents did. Or maybe what our sister does, or our brother, but nobody goes outside of that for parenting advice. And I said, well, now that may or may not be a good idea to do what your parents did, but that's what we do, right? Um, okay, screen time is talked about here, and uh, these are five and six-year-old kids. It used to be that the kids were getting their phone at confirmation. This has come backwards and backwards and backwards, and kids are getting phones now from quite a young age. They're getting screens from an even younger age, so they're getting tablets at six, seven, eight. They're getting I remember being out in Banaslow, the kids are getting, these are junior infants getting tablets and phones from Santa Claus, right? And they'll be on WhatsApp and TikTok, or not WhatsApp, Snapchat and TikTok. Because you, you bypass this thing, you're supposed to not be able to if you're 13. You have to be 13, but it's self, you know, you just put your date of birth and you move the year up and off you go. But I go out to restaurants and I see parents sitting there and the child is looking at the screen with the headphones on and this is a two-year-old, you know, so there's problems here. Um, sports and hobbies has talked about the idea of getting our young people introduced to a wider variety of extracurricular. A big part of what we want to try and do or move this project towards is, is this, why can't we do, do more of a, this investment piece, build, build this, build capacity into this space. Um, there's a whole interesting conversation around that, this, what, this scheme, and I think Maureen McIntyre is going to be doing the presentation after the copy break is going to probably talk about that more, so I'm going to skip over it, right. Um, making changes at home. If you've gone off track a little bit already, involving your children and, you know, just simple steps towards change. This is a big piece we're trying to get at, parents working together. Can we get classroom-based agreements going? Like, could you get the junior infant parents to all agree at the outset that nobody was getting a phone until the end of school? And there's a lot of an app, there is a big appetite out there for that in parent groups and what have you. So I think, you know, over time, we'll, we'll so a few couple of schools here in Galway taking it on this year as... I think they're going to be doing one in Ross Common. So we see, hopefully, um, the main ones would really would be the phones. That's alarming so many parents. Alar the phones, the five-year birthday per presents, you know, that kind of thing, and who gets to go to birthday parties and so on. But there's so much more you can do. Right? It's based on a thing that they did try in Iceland called the parental consensus. Right? Um, okay, there's a website devoted to, to parent power. It's a big undertaking. That's 15,000 books arriving into the office. So the one on the left is the parent power, the one on the right is the guidelines, first year one. That's a two year supply that's reprinted and updated after each survey for the next two years. And we tweak and modify and change. So the most recent guidelines for parents booklet would have had a lot more in the back page about vaping than had been in the middle one, right? Because vaping has obviously exploded. That's what the office looks like most of the time in the middle, right? Um, that's the before and that's the after. So that's going out there to schools, you know, and I have three girls from Salerno secondary coming into the office on Monday to start the process of getting the parent power booklet out the door because we, we spend September, October worrying about the first year one and then we start turn to the, you know, the national school one. Okay, um, just the demographics of it. These are a little out of date. I took this off an old presentation. We'll be higher. I think, I don't know. I'll have to check. I don't, because of the latest census, I don't quite get the data yet, but I think we're pushing up to 500,000 in the region, not 450. Um, so we've jumped a bit. Can't get a secondary school place in Galway, as I'm sure any parent who's got a sixth class kid here is stressing about. Uh, I know it's in my, in my sister-in-law is going up the walls because she's been refused by every school in Galway City for her sixth class kid, but... This is what we're dealing with. So we have 91 schools and centres. We include all the youth reaches. So 81 post-primary, 10 youth reach centres in the region. All participate. Every single one have all participated in each of the three surveys. So we have a full look. We're getting roughly 80% of the kids. The 20% that don't sit the survey aren't there in the day. 
right? We, we give the kids the opportunity, we're lucky, and Dermot is very helpful, in getting our ethical approval from the RCPI, Royal College of Physicians of Ireland, at the outset, and we did have a telephone interview and there was a discussion around their consent process. Active consent is usually what's required. A school is not going to take that on as a task to start doing actively administrating an active consent process to do something like this because you wouldn't, you'd only get 20% of the parents if you were lucky. And the, the, the level of admin involved would be off the charts, right? So we got the passive consent, we explained why we needed it, we're lucky to get it. Um, but roughly 80%, we send out whatever it is, about 6,000 consent forms to both the, kid, the kids and the parents. And you have to have obviously to consent to do this kind of stuff. It's a prerequisite. You're not, you're at, you can't even start without it, so forget it. But we only get about 30 to 50 forms back in every year of people saying they don't want to do it or they don't want their child to do it. So we get everybody. The, the 20% we don't get are, they're at a match usually is what's gone on, right? Or they're out that day. Okay, so Step Up website was built along the way. Uh, that was a COVID thing. The, the move from post-primary, or sorry, from primary to post-primary, that, that move is really stressful <laughs> for lots of kids and their parents, right? So the website was built to do it. And I remember there's people here in the audience, Pat Conway, I see Helen Butler from Youth Work Ireland, and we remember we were building the content for that, and it took us about three weeks to put it together, I think. I think there's 70,000 children in school in every year across the country. I think 35,000 of them use that website that year. It'll give you an idea how much stress there is around it. Um, and there's, there isn't any consistency around the, what happens with that move, by the way. Some schools do an amazing job of it, getting the coaching, getting them ready. Some schools do an amazing job of reaching out to those kids from first year, like the, the principals, are, they'll send staff into the national schools to meet the kids and bring them in. And, but it's, it's a postcode lottery. It's, you know, there could be a lot more standardization around it. It's certainly a big deal, do you know? Okay, talks about the topics of the move and things like that. Um, now, I want to spend a bit of time talking about this. School reports, these things are, are amazing. They're something of an innovation. We got, originally got school reports from Iceland in 2019. And Iceland, their reporting is always very tight into substance use and substance use prevention, risk and protective factors. And we realized at the outset, really, after the first round of data presentations from them, that we had everything we needed in here to really push for this as a health and well-being model, right? It doesn't have to just focus on the substance use. It can include that. But the data is telling us there's all sorts of other issues that we should be responding to. And broadly speaking, not always, but quite often, the risk and protective factors are the same, depending on what you're talking about. There's a lot of crossover. Um, and one of the things we did was we, we took the school reports that they gave us at the outset and we, we were back and forth. I think we had six iterations of it so we were saying, yeah, we, okay, we'll go with them, right? But the, we still weren't happy. And we knew with the second survey well, we wanted to come up with something much, much better for the schools. So we sat down, we came up with this one, and then we improved it quite substantially for the recent one. So we've, we've, and we'll improve it again for the next one. So every school that participates, and we have 81, that would have got an individual school report. As long as they have enough kids, there's a number 23. Yeah, if as long as they've got 23 or more, they'll get an individual report. So any tiny school like Elfin, the Island Schools, Colostra, Coleman up in uh, Rossport, they've hardly, you know, there's only a hand, you know. So she said, well, I have only four kids in TY. I said, well, include all the senior cycle. Get everybody in, get yourself to 23, however you do it, right? Your report will be out of range because your kids are gonna be older and you'll be looking a bit, you know, why are they all drinking so much? But at least you'll have an individual report. We also do combined reports. So for the island schools, we have three schools out in the Iron Islands. None of them could make the number. Well, actually, one could, but we do a combined report. So they'll have a, something useful. Um, now, like I said, there's copies of these, anonymized, but also combined. So the GRETV would get a youth reach report, 15 to 16-year-olds in youth research centres across the region, which is interesting to look at, really interesting to look at. Um, and so on combined reports okay uh this is what they look like the kind of 24 page document talks about a tiny bit about intro about the survey some infographics and so on their school experience these questions were modified by the uh, working group of five principals in the region so they fed into the latest questionnaire what more stuff that they wanted to know we're going to repeat that process the next time around um substance use behaviors there's a lot here in the school experience to so get on with the teachers to try your best in school. 
Do you, could you stand up for somebody that was being bullied? This kind of stuff. Lots of stuff around school experience. Substance use asked about in quite a fair bit of detail. Now, we, we stripped some out, stuff out. There was a lot of stuff in there around, like methamphetamine. You know, did you take in prescription medication without a doctor's prescription? And this, this, this. We didn't. It's just, not, it's, it's just bogging us down. We, need, we just need to know about the main stuff. That's what we ask about. I think we ask about eight now. So cocaine, ecstasy. I was asking about kids about heroin. I mean, they're not taking heroin. Why are we asking about it? You know, so that kind of stuff. We, we stripped stuff out. We substantially modified this questionnaire along the way um, for our use here. And that's one of the nice things, I suppose, with Iceland. They've allowed us to do that, right? Peer group behavior, their leisure time, their screen use, online behavior, well-being indicators, sleep, mental health. We added a new scale for resilience, brief resilience scale is called. We now have a measure for resilience in our young people that's never been asked in this country. We don't, we now have a working measure for resilience. So if that's something we were really interested about in, I think we are, we all want happy, young, resilient kids. Now we have something we can measure against to, to try and work into that space. We added, a, what else did we add? Stress. Um, it has Warwick Edinburgh subject wellbeing scale, short version. I won't go into it all. You can get the, you can get the questionnaires off ISTA if you want them. Uh, okay, sexual health was added. Gender differences, by the way, are very, very, very significant. And I know that say one size fits all, it's a whole population model, but there are probably certain ways to think about this from boys and girls too, a little, right? And people here from Sport Ireland going, yeah, 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 for sure. But um, there are big differences, right? Uh, cross tabulations is a way of presenting the data to the schools so they can begin to make more sense of the relationships between say bullying and mental health or sleep and school performance and that kind of thing. Okay, lots of those, right? Uh, some recommendations, a conclusion, simple recommendations around SPHE, facts, using the booklet for parents, that kind of thing. I, w I should iterate because I know the schools here, and schools are amazing places, right? They're busy places. And one thing we've always been trying to do since the outset and, may and, and, and continuing striving to do because we're coming to them, right? And we were lucky because they knew us. We'd been in and out of schools for years doing Garda program and different kind of things. So when we came knocking asking about the Icelandic prevention model, they were, they didn't really have to be convinced. They were, but they were, were, they were doing us a favor at the end of the day. It was like, let's get, we're here to give this a try. It wasn't like they were jumping all over it, do you know? And one thing I would kind of realize along the way is that there's always something new. There's always people coming asking about surveys, right? And we, we've been trying to get to this to the place where schools can see there's value in this for them. They can trust the process. So this is going to be happening. You could start to think about using this as a planning tool because actually it's going to happen the next time and it's going to happen the next time. It's not something that's just going to go away or let them down like they probably have been previously. <coughs> but the other thing what we try to do and point out is that we cannot be seen as a project that's making work for schools because schools have enough work, I assure you. Um, and they're really, their f first and foremost purpose is the delivery of the national curriculum. And now they're being asked to do all this other stuff and con constantly being asked to add another thing and do another thing. And now you're doing consent and now you're doing, you know. So we have to be careful that we're not adding work here. That all we're trying to do is say this, this is a way to inform better what you're doing maybe or save work or redirect resources or, you know, that's the thinking anyway. So the reports are excellent, really, really useful. The innovation is clever. It's done in PowerPoint. So that's what you're looking at here. This document is a PowerPoint document that's lifting the data out of an Excel file and dropping in the charts by school, by school, by school, or combination. So when I want to print these, I get the two templates. And we, we had a guy with Proactive Design do a lot of our design, and another guy called um, Cormac O'Donoghue, whose sister, as it happens, is principal in the new big new school in Chum, he was helping with the Excel and the data extraction. And we decided what we want. We kind of specified this is everything that we know. And we do up the charts and say, that's the chart we want. And he'll go off and do the pro program it in Excel to lift it out. It's a nice, it's a nice workaround. And it's, it's, um, it's there, it's a template. So we, when we go to do this in two years time, or a year's time, I suppose, we don't have to start again. You know, we're, we were, eight, you know, uh, say 80, we're 60% of the way there, you know, because we'd be changing everything again as usual. But, um, okay, FACTS website was built. This was in, back in 2021. 
it's bringing data for use in the classroom in a whole different... Oh, no, the slides are missing there. Okay. Um, I'll come back to that in a minute. This is the thing I want to talk about is sleep. Okay, so we can see in the second survey, actually been very clear in the COVID survey, that how many kids aren't sleeping. There's only 41% of them sleeping the right amount. It was 50, 41, it's bounced back to 44. But down here, we have 33% of kids only getting seven hours sleep, 15% only getting six hours sleep, and 8% getting less than six hours sleep. So those are kids that are going to, you know, we don't know actually. Well, I do, because I put in these additional questions. So I know how many are getting four hours sleep. But... The picture is bleak, right? This is a cross tabulation in the data between sleep and mental health, between sleep and well being, between this is Warwick Edinburgh's short Warwick Edinburgh subjective well being scale, sort of a clinical scale, certainly a validated scale. Seven questions about sure, well being, mental health and well being. It's, it's largely sort of how you see yourself in the future, or, you know, think you, you know, how, how do you think about your future when you think of your future? You, Happy, are you, you know, this kind of stuff. So, um, school engagement. Charlotte Silk, who's here, she's presenting, did the kind of co, you know, the, the, the bit of work in SPSS to develop the school engagement scale out of that string of kind of school experience questions. So, lifting out about, you know, feeling good in school and various different things. But it's not about academics, it's just school readiness, really. Stress, self esteem would be the same, the resilience is the same. The new measure for resilience would show this. So sleep and resilience, of course, directly interrelated. One of the big problems, 83% of them have a phone in their room because that was added in. So the first two surveys asked about how much are you sleeping? The third survey asked about how much are you sleeping? What time do you go to bed? What time do you get to sleep? What time do you get up for school? Do you ever fall asleep in the school? Do you feel tired during the day? Do you have a phone in your bedroom? So now we know, we never knew. Now we know 83% of kids have a phone in their bedroom. It's bonkers when you think of it. So there's a big part of the parental messaging around that. We've just about to launch this. I think Eileen's here. Eileen Ryan's from Castlereagh Community School. And she, her gang, right, and two of her staff and the kids were very helpful in doing a couple of videos. I'm going to show you one here quickly. Um, so the whole three lesson module on this. Now, we're not about health education. I always strive to point that out at the start. This project isn't and shouldn't really be about educating kids in school because that's the old way. That's what we do. That doesn't seem to be all that effective. So why are we... But at the same time, this is a huge gap, right? Because uh, it's not in the curriculum currently. So we, we, so we, we better come up with something here. But just to, to, to... Well, those guys are doing health education. We're not. And we're trying to stay away from it, right? But this is sort of a, a piece that was done, which is kind of going to be hugely well received. So three lessons. This is one module for sleep. I'm going to play you this quickly. I think of time. Two minutes. Um, Sleep teaching module for school, I, I won't show you all of it, but there's loads of resources and lesson plans and PowerPoints and everything that goes with it. But these are kind of fun, just to get the, the, uh, the conversation going in the classroom. So a teacher can play this, and then off you go. Let's have a talk about this. So. Hello. <laughs> Something about sleep, isn't it? Oh, I always I talk about sleep. Yeah, same. Mam says I do. I snore bad. This, oh, this guy can be loud. <laughs> if you don't get sleep before a call, then you're not going to sleep. <laughs> no, no. Have the phone in the rooms. rooms. Like, they can have their phone whenever they want, and, like, they go on it all night. Nowadays, there's social media, and there's yeah. TikTok, especially. I love an old podcast when I'm trying to sleep. I know, she's not too drunk, she wouldn't sleep listening to them. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think if I don't get good enough sleep the night before, the next day, it's not going to be a great day. I'll be irritable, I'll be angry, I'll be sad. 15%. 50%. I'm thinking like 40%. 50%. I remember having around like three hours of sleep and like I just sat down all day long. Thirty percent? Forty percent. Fifteen percent? Twenty percent? Jeez, that's a lot. It does affect my mental health. If I don't sleep well, I get mood swings. I'm very cranky when I don't sleep. You get no mood. No, oh, definitely, yeah. Mood. When you're not sleeping, it's such a bad mood. You need sleep to have energy. 
It's good for your mental health. Because you need your sleep for your energy for the entire day. Yeah, what you said. I used to sleep walk though. We lived in an estate and I lived like I got outside and I was in the front garden and my mother reckons I was shouting for my dad to come back. So I'd say 70 odd. I was going to say 75. <laughs> people don't want sleep during school. It's like the likes of us that have no light up. <laughs> oh, <laughs> we'll put the head down we'll just no, we sleep. will sleep regardless. I'm gonna say like 30%. 55? Has to be dark in the room. Yes, I cannot see. Has to be dark. Out. Turn off everything. Put your phone away. If you leave your phone in a different room, and maybe read a book before you go to bed to occupy your mind. Reading a book would be better than watching TikTok. Just to re read something you're interested in and even if you read a few pages of a book, you start to fall asleep. If your phone's in your room and you turn it on, your brain thinking, your brain's thinking that it's like daytime. The, you know the LEDs? It has like this blue light. Could not sleep with that on, so I have to turn it off every time. If you cheese before bed. It's like it, it, won't, it won't digest and you, your body is just staying away. <laughs> they're, they're great crack, aren't they? You know, a lot of fun. And that was really all, that was the brief. Energizers, get the conversation going. The video production company did a lovely job on it. Really, you know, kind of got the kids, you know, the personality comes across, I think, yeah. Okay, Step Up website. Um, talked about that, am I going the right way? Okay, so the municipal reporting are 52 page documents. Uh, which we are happy with. There's a lot, there's a huge amount of work. Me and Michal predominantly sit down and put our heads together and think about these and how are we going to present the data and what are we going to talk about and what, are, how, who are we to make recommendations and it's, a, it's, it's, it's tricky, right, but they're, they're excellent documents and they really show what it's like growing up as a teen, right, What's, what are, how are teenagers getting on? Um, the most recent one, for the first time we had trends, okay, we had trends now, some alarming trends, some interesting trends, but we have trends, right? Now, COVID sort of skewed things a bit, but we certainly do can begin to see things becoming clear, which we is amazing, actually, to have this two-year thing. You now, all of a sudden, you can start to track things that are changing, like things that happen fast, like the vaping thing is kind of blown up, really, in the last two years. So, okay, this is one of the alarming ones. You won't be able to read this, but if you, if you get a look at the PDF or the download, this one in the middle here is a perceived parental tolerance. So how would your parents feel about you vaping, smoking, uh, smoking cannabis, getting drunk, right? And this is one, that one there, right? So that one there is the same across the region. This parental talent, the perceived parent, well, how would your parents feel about you getting drunk? It's been on the slide now for the three surveys. And wherever we see it most, the kids are drinking more, they're drinking more at home, they're drinking more in the pub, so it's, it's a huge issue, and I mean, kind of bending Dermot's ear about we need we need to really be looking at this as a national campaign around parental alcohol supply, because it's no good what's going on. The people, and we understand why it happened. Parents might think, well, that's, that's sort of the right thing to do. They're safe, or they're this or that. We all did it. Aren't we fine? And we're fine. Aren't we fine? Well, the person might be fine, but we're not fine as a society. We're bananas. Like there are problems that it causes. So. It does need a lot of work, but this it's really interesting in the data to see it. I won't go into that, right? There, we do have very compelling local data, though. All right, this one, um, I don't know if Breda's here. Is Breda here? Breda Ryan. Oh, here. Hi, Breda. Um, so this is something that's happening currently up in Belmullet, right? And we, we, there's kind of this kind of dearth of services. Belmullet sort of a area deprivation. There's not services. There's kind of unemployment. There's all this sort of stuff, but Breda and... Uh, some colleagues of the Irish Youth Project were kind of just having this idea we need to do a bit more and you know look at the planet youth data for just our patch Bangareras right and we did I did, I put, I did a bit job of this a couple three weeks ago maybe we were, and they had a meeting about it there's another meeting in December the 10th or 11th but so when I went up to do the Garda program in Belmullet at Our Lady's School or was it St. Brendan's one of the schools there and I hadn't been there ever before but it was up there four or five weeks ago, right, um, to do the pre-junior cert program, we call it, say, safe to sober, right, but 
The first thing the school coordinator said when I walked in the door, she said, these kids are drinking since they're 14. Do you know, they're not drinking in first class, they're drinking in second, first year, I should say. Um, but when we went and looked at this data for, for the three combined schools in the area, you can see here, they're double everywhere else. <laughs> it's bonkers, like right? what's going on? So for their alcohol use, and this is the most recent survey. So what I went in, I said, look, better go back and check. So we recoded the data set. So we'll have a look at 2018 and 2020. What's that saying? And it's the same story. So it's not just a one-off. Um, and then if you look here, you see, so they're getting more, they're drinking more, they're more cannabis now. They weren't before, but they're smoking more cannabis than they were. They weren't always higher, but they are now. Um, drunk in the last 30 days, drunk in the last, drunk in their lifetime, vaping way higher than everywhere else. Drinking in the pub, 49% of them, compared to about a quarter. So, now, we were saying we can't be the, Bel we can't be the fun police arriving into Belmullet because, you know, you'd, you'd be run out of town. But there is something going on here. Is there, is there an appetite to do something? Now, having said all that, the data is not supposed to be singling out areas. It's a whole population model, right? But at the same time, we do what we can do with the data. Now, I better get speeding up because I have a lot of ground still to cover. We do a lot of social media and video. Um, we pushed uh, a lot over the, site, the two surveys. We didn't do one recently, but we probably will at some point. Uh, out to parents, Facebook, Twitter, stuff, we, you know. Um, I'll do this one quickly. The latest Planet Youth survey has highlighted areas that our teens might need some more support and direction. Our teenagers are drinking too much alcohol, and we as parents need to be more careful. Use of alcohol at a young age will increase the chance of a dependency later in life, and the survey showed us that the teens being given alcohol by their parents were over three times more likely to have been drunk in the last month. For guidelines and some tips on how you can make a difference in your teen's life, Download the parents' booklet from the Planet Youth website. So, nice little video. Um, there's a few of them. There's loads of them in different topics. So sleep, physical health, you know, different kind of things. Um, I won't go into them. I have one here for sleep, but I won't, we won't have time. We'll keep going. Um, so loads of stakeholders, our committees, our schools, our parents, you know, everybody was asked about what they thought. Um, and it kind of, it's not a, it's, it's only something of a process slash output evaluation. That's all it ever was. It, the terms of reference are in there, what, what we want to know. We weren't really looking for outcomes and we didn't anticipate any. Um, there are interesting changes in the data, like that parenting thing is mad stuff, right? But then there's, in, there's interesting stuff about parents being able to talk to their kids. You know, can you, can you talk to your parents about personal matters, right? That's gone up in the last three surveys. It's really encouraging, right? But um, we haven't seen anything in the substance use data to say we've made any impact. It's gone up, do you remember? So it's 26, 20, 30, right? We were saying it's probably, a, this is a 10 year piece of work, right? The, and I think it probably was in Iceland, 15 till they got to where they got to, but there's lots of other things they did. It wasn't just this, do you know? They had a different, you know, all sorts of interesting things happened up there, systemic changes that we're really gonna to struggle to get to do, but we'll see, right? Um, the conclusion, so it's, the structures is what was discussed in here, right? So we need to move and start, we've done a lot in the five years, we've done a huge push into the parenting space, the school space, we haven't done in the two domains of peer group, we've done nothing, nothing really, as in nothing direct, and in that leisure time space, we haven't done anything either, right? So we're saying, well, by moving to a thematic subgroup structure for the next round of this, we will hopefully advance those a little bit more because they'll get much more focused than they would have otherwise by the county committees. Because people come to the county committee meetings and they might be interested in parents, but they're not interested in peer, you know, so everybody's got different things. So by a more targeted focus, we're hoping to do that. Loads of modifications along the way, sleep, attitudes, substance harms, school experience, diet, uh, scales, new scales for resilience and stress, can you access facilities, and so on. So if we've done stuff for the council, for Tusla, for... Uh, university, you know, we've, we've added and changed, we've modified things for schools and we can, and that's part of the partnership process, so everybody's been invited to what do you need to know, the sexual health stuff was put in by, asked about racism, um, all sorts of stuff is in here. Secondary use of the data are important, I'm running out of time here rapidly, but, uh, okay, I'm way out, am I? Okay, all right, about, so to wrap it up, um, am I? I have this on stopwatch, I thought I had 45 minutes, sugar. Okay, 
everything goes up in ISTA. The data is available to all the partner agencies, right? It supports funding applications. Our, our youth officers need to be have made great use of this for funding applications for UBU and so on. Um, for example, the Bell Mullet stuff and so on. And they're looking for data next week, I think, for Claire Morris to make a UBU application. Other agencies, public health applications, all sorts of academic applications which will be talked about later today. So we position this as a public health program designed to improve long-term health and life outcomes for young people, not a substance use prevention model. Okay, that's us here though. Okay, that's the vision statement. I always try and finish on this, right? This is what's not talked about nearly enough. That's what we're trying to get to. You think of all those kids getting drunk downtown in Iceland every weekend or all week. By doing this kind of preventative work, you've put the, all those kids on a different path. So the kids, that they're, they're not there at 42% anymore. They're down here at one. You know, so can we, can we get to something like that? Because that's really what good quality preventative work is about. It's about changing the, the, the future for people or changing the course that they're on. That's it. The .ie is there. Uh, you get in touch with any of us through that. Thank you. Sorry so long. <laughs>